Hello, everyone. I am Betsy Fisher Martin, the executive director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. And I do see some new names and avatars in our audience. So if you aren't familiar with WPI, we are a nonpartisan institute at American University School of Public Affairs, and we aim to close the gender gap in political leadership. We offer academic and practical training and we facilitate research and discussions like this on the importance of women in politics. We'd like to welcome all of you, including so many of our AU students, faculty, and alums to the first of our summer series, Women on Wednesdays. We are so pleased to have with us this evening, Molly Ball with Time Magazine. She is a longtime political journalist who's reported for Politico and The Atlantic. And she has written this terrific new book on speaker Nancy Pelosi, appropriately entitled Pelosi. Uh, it was just published last week and has already received so many great reviews. Uh, I'm eager to talk to her about Speaker Pelosi's life and career, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions from you in the audience. If you're not familiar with this Crowdcast platform, uh, you'll notice a button on the bottom of the screen uh, to ask a question. Please do so during the course of our discussion, and you'll also be able to upvote other questions uh, that you're also interested in. So uh, there's also a green button there you'll see um, toward the bottom of the screen as well that links to a purchase page for Molly's book if you haven't read it yet. And if you would like to replay any of this event, uh, the link will be available on this same registration site. Uh, and if you're interested in tweeting anything about the event, we are using the hashtag WPI Women on Wednesdays. So with that, uh, welcome, Molly. Thank you so much uh, for doing this. We really appreciate it. I want to start with this iconic image um, of Nancy Pelosi. Now, me being a former TV producer, I, of course, have some other visuals uh, to go along with this. But I wanted to ask you, tell us that backstory of when she walked out of the White House in that red coat, what that meant symbolically. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much, Betsy, for having me. I um, love the Institute, love the work that you guys do, and really appreciate your attention to this book. And thank you, everyone, for being here at this uh, virtual event. Um, so yes, I, I didn't design the cover, but I love that image. And it's, it sums up so much of what the book is about and what Nancy Pelosi is about. So to refresh everyone's memory, uh, this was December 11th, 2018. So the Democrats had just won the House of Representatives in the midterm elections. Uh, and Nancy Pelosi was fighting to become Speaker of the House again. To do that, she had to win over the vast majority of her colleagues, the Democrats in the House of Representatives, many of which, many of whom had some angst about the fact that she had been their leader for so long, that she has a sort of polarizing public image. And there was this effort to try to get her out and not have her be the speaker again. Uh, meanwhile, there, there were negotiations going on between the, the Democrats and Republicans in the White House to try to keep the government open to prevent a shutdown, uh, which obviously didn't end up working out. Uh, so that day, actually, Chuck Schumer, the Senate Democratic leader, had been invited to the White House. Nancy Pelosi had not. Uh, but Schumer correctly guessed that the White House was trying to divide and conquer the Democrats. So he invited Pelosi along and they strategized in advance. They had a game plan. It wasn't very complicated, but they just decided that they were going to confront the president uh, with the truth to uh, get him out of what they considered his sort of fact-free zone, surrounded by advisors who are always telling him he's right. Uh, so they went into this meeting thinking it would be a closed door negotiation. Uh, President Trump, as he sometimes does, decided it would be an open press meeting and invited the cameras to stay. So they're doing this negotiation on camera. They're talking about the border wall. They're talking about the sh whether there will be a shutdown. And Trump, knowing that Pelosi is embroiled in this battle for the speakership, at one point sort of insults her and says, you know, Nancy, I know is in a tough position right now because of her situation with her caucus. And she interrupts him. She has a long history of uh, being willing to interrupt men when they're talking about her in her presence. And she said, she shut him down and she said, Mr. President, please don't characterize the strength that I, the strength that I bring to this meeting is the leader of the House Democrats who just won a big victory. So the meeting goes on and they get Trump to take ownership for a potential shutdown if it happens. Uh, and this is all on camera. So Twitter's starting to blow up uh, just with the, the with what she had said. And then she walks out and she puts on this coat and the sunglasses and she smiles that little 
self-satisfied smile and immediately became a meme for a lot of reasons. I think for a lot of Democrats and liberals, this was the first time they had seen President Trump confronted to his face in this way. But it also meant a lot to a lot of people. And, and the fact that you know, the biggest reason the Democrats won the midterms was that there was a huge wave of women's political activism, women voters and women candidates, uh, particularly on the Democratic side. So I, I think for a lot of those activists and voters and, uh, and, and elected officials, it was extra meaningful to see a woman stand up to Trump in that way, to see a, a woman uh, refuse to sort of stand down in the face of the, the president's insults and to then, you know, walk out and, and, and smile knowing that she's won this particular round of the battle. So uh, the last thing I'll say about that image is just that people are always curious about the speaker's clothes. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that curiosity. I don't think it's sexist to want to know about somebody's, somebody's look. Presentation is a big part of politics. Uh, interestingly, she she has a big closet, but she rewears stuff all the time. She's not one of these people that buys a new dress for every occasion. And she'd actually worn that same coat to Barack Obama's second inauguration in 2013. Uh, and when she's asked about it now, uh, she is actually kind of frustrated that the coat became such a thing because now she can't wear it again without people thinking she's making a statement. <laughs> and it did sell out, didn't it? It, it was actually Just discontinued more, right? at the time that she wore it meeting. They reissued it okay. because, of, because of the demand that this image created. Now, she goes back to the White House um, 10 months later when she is speaker again. Uh, she, she won that race. She goes back as speaker. And there's another iconic photo uh, that you write about where she is uh, in front of that room full of men um at the white house you said there she was the speaker with the steel spine standing up to the petulant president while a room full of men preferred to avert their eyes talk a little bit about how she has handled uh, president trump in her speakership sure yeah i mean i think it's been clear from the beginning that she has a unique way of sort of getting under his skin uh, and that he is he has a sort of grudging respect for her he's referred frequently to her toughness and this is a pretty inarguable characteristic that Nancy Pelosi has, whether or not you like her, she's a very tough person and a tough leader. And we know that that's a quality that the president respects in, in people. Uh, he doesn't quite know how to handle her, right? She doesn't back down. She doesn't sit down and, and take it when, when, when he, you know, shouts at her or insults her or whatever. And in this particular meeting, this was a, a, a briefing on, on the situation in Syria uh, when the American troops had just pulled out uh, and 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 left the basically a bloodbath in their wake, and a lot of people, including Republicans, were calling this an irresponsible thing to do. Uh, and it was Nancy Pelosi standing up, and so so after this meeting ended, so what happened actually is she later said she, she was standing up and saying to the president, "All roads with you lead to Putin." And then he insulted her and she walked out with some of the other Democrats. Uh, but it was the White House that put out this photo. Mm -hmm. And the photo was taken by a White House photographer. It never would have become public, except that Trump tweeted it to accuse her of having had a meltdown, having had like a, a, a hissy fit basically. Uh, but it resonated very differently with large segments of the public. Again, I think especially women, uh, this image seemed very powerful that she, she again was standing up to him you know, telling him to his face what she thought of him, pointing at him. It, another just funny side note, she did. She said in an interview years ago that she knows a lot of people think it's rude to point, uh, but she just can't help it. She's tried, you know, a lot of politicians do this instead of pointing because it seems like less accusatory, less pointed, uh, right. but she just can't help it. She just, she just always, and she does this a lot. She's always pointing at people when she wants to make a point. Uh, so, but, so I asked her about this image and I was interested in, you know, all these images becoming memes, I think is a symptom of not only the way Nancy Pelosi's image has changed in the past couple of years as, as more people sort of appreciate her qualities, uh, but also the way that uh, society and, and what we value in a woman has changed. The, the assertiveness, the aggressiveness that she embodies for large parts of her career was, was, was seen as, uh, you know, people didn't like it. And, and now they do, because I think our culture has changed to appreciate those qualities. Um, and when I asked her about that, I, I was hoping to get her to reflect on how her image has changed and how the culture has changed. 
Uh, and she didn't, her mind didn't go there at all. She sort of laughed it off. And, and she said, I just can't believe the White House put this picture out. Uh, she was thinking about was strategy. She's thinking about, you know, how does this, how does this help or hurt me in the negotiations? And, and what really amazed her was not that people liked this photo, uh, or that it, you know, resonated as, you know, the only woman in the room full of men. Uh, but what resonated with her was just, she said, he does not know what is in his interest. So it was the strategy that she was thinking about, not the symbolism. And I think that's very telling about her mindset. She gets this political, um, you know, antenna from her family. And you write about sort of the early life of, of then uh, a, a little girl, Nancy D'Alessandro from Baltimore and her father and her mother. Um, tell us a little bit about, of course, her father was a former member of Congress, longtime mayor of Baltimore. Tell her about, tell us about her upbringing uh, in such a political family and what that meant for her. Sure. Yeah. Well, she obviously went into the family business. Her father was a politician and her brother also uh, went into the family business, uh, was later the, the mayor of Baltimore for one term. Uh, but she was never really, really expected to go into the family business because she was a girl. She had five older brothers and they were all to varying degrees sort of trained in the political arts. Uh, she was not. She was part of the, the family political enterprise, as was her mother. Uh, but but no one expected that that she would actually run for office herself just because she was a girl. So, uh, you know, a lot has been said about her father's influence and the ways the, 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 the things that she must have learned from her father's political style, going back to the, you know, the sort of heyday of sort of uh, white ethnic democratic urban machine politics. And you can see, clearly see some of those hallmarks in her career. But I really argue, number one, that she's made her own way for the most part because she wasn't expected to, to go into the family business. And, and number two, that she was just as influenced by her mother. Uh, but her mother has been sort of erased from this history because her mother didn't have a title in front of her name, because whatever contributions her mother made to the family political enterprise were, were, were essentially uncredited. She, Nancy Pelosi talks about her mother as being sort of the strategist behind her father's political career, but she also talks very frankly about the ways in which her mother was stifled in her life. You know, being a woman in you know the 1920s and 30s, she there were a lot of dreams that she had that she wasn't able to fulfill. She wanted to go to law school. She wanted to be an engineer. She wanted to go into business. At one point, she invented and patented a beauty product. Uh, but in those days, you had to have a man's signature to uh, to do a lot of financial transactions, and her husband would not give it to her. So she wasn't able to expand her business nationally as she wanted to. So that clearly made a deep impression on Nancy Pelosi, the things her mother was not able to do simply because she was a woman. And then her, the other thing that I think is important about her mother's influence is that her mother was clearly a sort of a, a fiery and, and, and somewhat aggressive woman. And you can see some of those characteristics, I think, in her daughter. She uh, There's a story that she once punched a poll worker who was uh, who, who was saying things she didn't like. She stood up to presidents, including LBJ and Ronald Reagan. Uh, so she she also was someone with, with a spine of steel, I think it's safe to say. And so Nancy moves out to San Francisco with her husband. She has five children in uh, the course of six years. Uh, tell us about her entry into politics, which really started as a fundraiser, right? That's right. She never stopped being political in the sense that she was always active in the Democratic Party. Uh, from the time she was, you know, having all those babies, five children in six years, she was slipping Democratic leaflets under the doors of, of people's houses and apartments while pushing the stroller around the neighborhood, first in New York and then in San Francisco. Uh, but her political activism was always sort of within these institutions, within the party, within these sort of establishment, you could say, not part of the sort of protest and activist movements that so many young people were a part of in the 1970s. And then uh, starting in 1975, when she was appointed to the San Francisco Library Commission, her first official position in which she had a vote uh, and a voice, uh, she was a, she was primarily a volunteer and she was a fundraiser. She, mm -hmm. she became sort of legendary as a stop on the national democratic fundraising circuit because she was so good at raising money for, for candidates. Uh, and uh, eventually that led to 
positions in the, the party hierarchy. She became chair of the California Democratic Party, the largest Democratic Party in the country. Uh, she uh, brought the 1984 uh, Democratic Convention to San Francisco and then made a, a failed run for chair of the DNC. So all of that was before she ran for office. She always said she didn't want to run for office. People asked her many times over the years and she always said she considered herself more of a strategist, of a behind the scenes person. But in 1987, in sort of dramatic fashion, she was pulled into the game when her dear friend, Sala Burton, uh, who was a member of Congress, who'd followed actually her husband into Congress uh, when he died, which was the way a lot of women got to Congress in those days. Uh, Sala Burton was dying of cancer and called her friend Nancy Pelosi to her deathbed in the sort of it sounds too dramatic to be real, but there are witnesses to this. It did really happen. Uh, called Nancy Pelosi to her bedside and implored her to run for the seat in Congress when and if uh, she were to pass away. And so having promised her friend that she would do this, she then uh, waged this, what ended up being a very hard fought campaign against 13 other candidates in a special election in 1987. Obviously she was successful and that's the last competitive election she ever really had. So she comes to Congress and she uh, she's then only one of 23 women in the House. How does she navigate that environment um, where men are really running the place? Uh, how did she maneuver around that? And also, if you can touch, there's a great quote that you have in the book uh, from George Miller, a congressman uh, also from California, and who gave her some advice that she didn't really heed at all. He said, there's a free hedge clipping service in Washington, meaning the more you stuck your head up, the more likely you were to get it cut down. And, and that did, she did not take that to heart at all. No, I think she did actually, because what she did in the early years in Congress was she did put her head down and, and, and immerse herself in her legislative work. She immersed herself in policy. She focused her efforts, not on climbing the leadership ladder, but on getting on the best committees the appropriations right. committee and so on uh, in order to very, do the most she was very vocal like, on her work. He was outspoken on the issue of, you know, AIDS yeah. and that kind of thing. I mean, she just, she, what I mean is she jumped in and sort of took a lead on some big issues. She definitely did. She definitely did. And, and particularly the AIDS issue because it was the height of the AIDS crisis and representing San Francisco, that was a really important issue in her district and also a personal passion, I think of hers. Yeah. Um, so yes, she did become prominent on on certain issues, but she wasn't the sort of you know freshman who's seeking the limelight, trying to you know get on TV and in the press all the time. She was very much focused on her legislative work, and and as you say, there were only 23 women in the entire 435 member House of Representatives. Uh, so she realized that you know she needed to make friends and make allies and 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 find you know the men who would support her and would take her seriously. I think. The hardest thing for her in those early years was just to get the the men to take her and the other women in the house seriously because there were so few of them that they they sort of didn't uh, didn't seem like they mattered to a lot of the men in charge and so it was by doing the work by showing that she knew her stuff by 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 making herself important by being relentless on the issues that she cared about uh, that she was able to impress uh, and, and building alliances with sort of unlikely allies, right? Particularly the the more conservative uh, Democrats in the caucus, uh, the uh, conservative Pennsylvania Democrat Jack Murtha became a very crucial ally of hers. And those kind of alliances kept her from being pigeonholed as, as just a San Francisco liberal. And then she decides to wage a very long campaign uh, to become the Democratic whip, the number two position. Um, she starts in campaigning sort of behind the scenes for that post in 1990, after the 1998 midterms, the position didn't even come open until 2001. Talk about her decision to enter leadership um, and how, um, how that impacted her. And how she was able to really lay, those, lay that groundwork for a very long time. Yeah, she'd been in the House, right, as you say, she'd been in the House for 10 years already. And, and if you think about 1998, uh, the Democrats have been in the minority ever since the 1994 uh, Newt Gingrich Republican Rev Revolution. Uh, and so the position she is is campaigning for, Democratic whip, would only become 
available if the Democrats won back the majority, which they felt like they were right on the cusp of doing, but uh, which didn't happen for, for then several election cycles. So she had to keep this campaign going. But it is really interesting and, and, uh, and funny what the sort of reception she got when she announced that she was going to seek this position in leadership, word sort of came back to her through the house grapevine uh, that what the men in charge were saying was, well, who said she could run? Right. And that just, she said that her reaction to that was, well, light my fire, why don't you? It just gave her motivation because to her, she didn't need anybody's permission and she shouldn't have had to ask anybody's permission. And the idea that she did uh, was was infuriating enough to just motivate her more. There was also a moment when uh, she heard that one of the men in the leadership had said, well, if the women want a voice, why don't they just give us a list of the stuff that they want us to do and we'll get it done for them. <laughs> they have to be in there and do it themselves. So she just took all this as motivation. And, and then the other thing was, you know, the Democrats having been in the minority uh, for several cycles at that point, she was very frustrated with what she saw as an outdated campaign strategy. She thought that the leadership was was complacent and was not uh, sufficiently focused on winning. So, uh, you know, there's a moment when she has a conversation with George George Miller. She's trying to convince the leadership to to bring their campaign strategy into the 21st century, and nobody's really interested. And she says to George Miller, "I think these boys don't know how to win." And so she realized that. Uh, it was going to be up to, to her and her determination to to help the Democrats try to take back the House. And in fact, the position ended up coming open uh, because of, of retirements but before, long before the Democrats uh, took over the House. And she became whip. In that picture there, she's holding the actual whip that the whip, uh, the whip is the person most people know who rounds up the votes in the caucus, the number two position below minority leader when you're in the minority. Uh, and the number three position when you're in the majority. Uh, and there's a ceremonial actual whip that gets passed along from, from one office holder to another. So there she is when she's just become the Democratic whip in October 2001. And that was a hard fought race that she ran against Denny Hoyer. That's right. And, uh, and, and, and there's a lot of interesting connections. Yeah. Denny Hoyer, a congressman from the Baltimore area who grew up right alongside the D'Alessandro family. He was from a more sort of working class background where she was sort of political royalty. And they actually worked together uh, in a senator's office the year that she graduated from college. She and Steny Hoyer uh, were, were staffers in the office of Maryland Senator Daniel Brewster. And, and, and so they knew each other going back to 1963 but no one ever could have guessed that they would both end up in Congress and, and be running, seeking the same post in Democratic leadership in the 1990s. It was a very hard fought battle. Hoyer seen as more of a moderate, uh, sort of well-liked uh, 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 Democrat and who, who, who most people thought was next in line for the post. She'd run for it before. Uh, so she was running against the sort of establishment order of things. And, uh, but she, you know, she she was she waged a very disciplined campaign, complete with walkie talkies in the hallways on election day to make sure that everyone was being tracked down and coming to the caucus meeting, so that they could vote for her. Which actually is what a lot made her an effective whip in the first place. Her ability to sort of count count the votes. Exactly. Um, so she becomes speaker in '07. Um, and you write about, and this is interesting because of your affiliation now with Time Magazine, but you wrote that not a single American news magazine during the time that she was first speaker featured her on the cover, not Time, not Newsweek, US News, any of them. And you said feminism was out of fashion and the culture wasn't ready to appreciate the complexity of a woman who was both devoted to her family and a hard charging ruthless Paul. Quote, badass had not yet entered the American lexicon as a characteristic for women to aspire to. What yeah. do you think that is, and tell us about sort of, you know, how she has positioned herself as, um, you know, being uh, hard charging, but also she is a grandmother, she's a mother, and, you know, look her up there with all of the, with all of the children. Yeah. So it's funny, you know, when you study women politicians, there's often this effect that women resist to sort of soften them, right? To define them by their families and their children and their outfits and their hair and whatever else. And and so, uh, and, and, and oddly for Nancy Pelosi, it's been sort of the opposite, right? She's always been defined as this very 
uh, ruthless partisan, this this rigid and and domineering uh, sort of archetype. Uh, and and when she has at various points tried to soften her image to point out, look, I'm a, I'm a grandmother. I was an Italian Catholic housewife before I went into politics. Uh, that side of her never really entered the public persona, uh, maybe because it wasn't as relevant to her legislative MO, but she is both of those things. And, and she is a complex character for that reason. And I do find it really interesting that whereas so many female politicians do try to sort of harden their image and make themselves seem almost more masculine. Think of Hillary Clinton in 2008, you know, running as a sort of hawkish, almost like Margaret Thatcher figure, uh, seem, trying to, to sort of impersonate a man in order to be seen as eligible for these, you know, historically male positions. Uh, Nancy Pelosi has never done that. She's always embraced a, a very feminine public image, whether it's the way she dresses, the way she talks about her family always has, has foreground children, when she's asked about why she's in politics, she always says the same thing, the children, the children, the children, uh, which is, you know, a corny thing to say, but uh, she, she says that that is her lodestar, that that's the reason that she does all of this. Um, and, and so I find that very interesting, I, you know, because there have been so few women in high political office, there aren't a lot of archetypes for, for how to be that. Uh, and she's very much done it her own way rather than sort of following any previous prescription. Let's talk about her kind of uh, being uh, the villain, if you will, to the Republican Party leading up to the midterms uh, in 2010. She was featured in more than twice as many Republican attack ads as Obama was sitting president. Um, and you said Pelosi just got a rise out of people. Uh, why was she used as a, an effective sort of villain in the Democratic Party by the Republicans? Um, so effectively in, in 2010? Well, going back to that convention in 1984, yeah. actually, the Republicans had used, you know, San Francisco Democrat as a way to associate the entire Democratic Party with the sort of far left liberalism epitomized by San Francisco. Uh, Nancy Pelosi believes that it's essentially a homophobic slur, that that's, it's essentially a dog whistle for homophobia. Now, mm -hmm. I think Republicans would probably say there's a lot of different political issues that are invoked by that trope. Um, but she she believes that especially with San Francisco having been on the leading edge of gay rights, and she has always been on the leading edge of gay rights long before it was fashionable, even for Democrats to uh, be in favor of, of gay rights and gay marriage. Uh, she was there because of her district and because of her own political compass. Uh, so fast forward to 2010, the Republicans just discovered that even though Obama's popularity had eroded, he was still a lot more popular than Congress and than the Washington Democrats. And Nancy Pelosi in particular, they just noticed when they started you know, using her face to fundraise with their base voters, people clicked, people donated. She just got a rise out of people. You could mention her around sort of conservative rank and file voters and they just get really mad. So Republicans realized that she would be an effective tool for them to sort of rally their base and it's also part of the nationalization of politics that has been occurring over the past couple decades, right? So Democrats are trying to appeal to uh, voters in, in swing districts in, in Republican leaning seats by running conservative leaning Democrats and Democrats whose profiles fit the profile of that district. Uh, and Republicans were well within their rights to remind those voters, well, actually a vote for this conservative Democrat is a vote to put Nancy Pelosi in charge of the House. It's a vote to make this San Francisco liberal the Speaker of the House. So for all of those reasons, uh, they they went all in on that strategy. Now, there were a lot of factors in 2010. Uh, you know, the economy was still in the toilet. Uh, the a lot, the, the health care bill that she had been instrumental in moving through the House was tremendously unpopular. A president's party almost always loses seats in a midterm. So, but it's interesting that what Republicans took away from their victory that cycle was right. Nancy Pelosi is an effective electoral message for us. Right. And then she, she actually stays as the Democratic leader, whereas frequently if you're the Speaker of the House and your party loses, you probably step down. And she never did that. And she stayed, um, until several cycles later, until she becomes obviously the, the speaker again um, after the 2018 midterms. And she was criticized for her decision to um, actually stick it out and, and stay. And she finally she finally makes the cover of, of Time magazine, 
written by one Molly Ball, <laughs> uh, leading up to the 2018 midterms. And you write a lot about that in that piece. Um, you know, the head, the cover story there, the persistence uh, of Nancy Pelosi. Um, you, on the, the headline on the jump is, Nancy Pelosi doesn't care what you think of her and she isn't going anywhere. Talk about her decision during those couple of, uh, of years to stay as the leader of the Democrats and her kind of comeback um, after the 2018 midterms. Yeah, I mean, a common uh, theme in the, the life of Nancy Pelosi, the descriptions of Nancy Pelosi is her tenaciousness, right? Yeah. Perhaps even stubbornness. Uh, she doesn't like anyone telling her what to do. And I think it actually does go back to her childhood when she felt sort of hemmed in and overprotected by her family and by all of her older brothers and her father. Uh, so, um, so she's always wanted to be in control, wanted independence, and she doesn't like anybody trying to sort of chase her out of what to do. But also, you know, I spoke to a former aide of hers whose description um, I've never forgotten. He said, everything Nancy Pelosi does is, is motivated by this mixture of obligation and confidence. You might even call it entitlement. She looks at a situation and says, well, somebody has to do it. And I am the one, I'm the one who can do it best. And so when it came to running the House Democratic Caucus, she simply didn't see anyone, whether it was 2010, 2012, 2014, 2016, all these elections that the Democrats kept losing, she still didn't think there was anyone better than her to be in charge of the caucus. And obviously the vast majority of House Democrats agreed or she wouldn't have been able to stay in that position. Uh, at the same time, there was mounting angst in the, in the ranks of the House caucus. There was mounting angst not just about her, but about the fact that she and her two lieutenants, Denny Hoyer and Jim Clyburn, had been the Democratic leaders for, at that point, 15 years. Mm -hmm. So if you were an up and coming young Democrat, like a young Nancy Pelosi once was, and you wanted to move up into leadership, you wanted to have more of a more power in the caucus, it was all sort of frozen and you couldn't get anywhere for 15 years. So and, and so that combined with her increasingly toxic public image and the hundreds of millions of dollars in attack ads and Democrats were tired of having to go home to their districts and answer for her being their leader with two constituents who, uh, for whatever reason, uh, found her just awful. So, uh, so there was, the, uh, but it was interesting to me and what I wrote about in that piece was, this was coinciding in 2018 with this incredible wave of women with this incredible wave of women voters and women activists and women candidates. So it was a sort of, a, sort of ironic that the angst about Nancy Pelosi's leadership, the first woman speaker, was coming to a head at the same time women were getting active in democratic politics like never before. And, and, uh, and, and so, this, so this cover, which I wrote and we published in September 2018, uh, I think was, a, was kind of prescient because that was sort of the point that I made in the piece and then it was almost as if the day after the Democrats won the midterms, yes. the image changed and everybody sort of woke up and said, oh, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't get rid of her. Maybe she's actually good at this. And because the objections to her were never about who is the best person at doing the job of running the House, who is the best person at keeping the House Democrats together, getting big complex legislation drafted and put pushed through the Congress doing that actual legislative strategy, the actual job of the House Speaker, no one ever doubted her ability to do that. It was just about how she was viewed outside the building and, and, and how long she'd been in the job that was the source of the angst. You alluded to this a, a little while ago, but um, her, um, and you wrote a blog post about this for our Gender on the Ballot blog um, this morning, which was terrific, where she doesn't shy away from, she knows her worth. She knows, she says, I am a master legislator. I am a shrewd politician. She doesn't shrink away from that. Um, can you just reflect a little bit on, on her sort of confidence in that respect that she has for herself and, and her willingness to promote herself? Because if she doesn't do it, no one else is going to. That's right. I love that quote from her. She says, self-promotion is a terrible thing, but, but evidently somebody's got to do it. Right. <laughs> And I think that, you know, this is a change in, in researching her and, you know, reading hundreds, maybe thousands of articles that have been written about her since the start of her career. It's really a change that I observed in her public rhetoric starting after 2016. And I think it is because she realized, you know, she always said, she said to me and others, I don't care what they say about me. 
you know, what I'm focused on is being effective. If I weren't effective, I wouldn't be a target. She almost positioned herself as I'm, I'm happy to be the punching bag, you know, and take the heat uh, for everybody else. Uh, because she's always been focused on results. She's always been focused on that inside game, the job that she does inside the building, passing legislation. Uh, and so I, I believe that it was when she realized that her negative public image was harming her ability to get results, was harming her ability to do that job inside the building, was harming her ability to stay in her leadership position and, and, and become speaker again. That's when she started to care more about making sure people recognized the strengths that she brought to the process, whether it was her fundraising prowess or her being a, a, a master legislator, as she put it. So you see her start talking more aggressively about what she views as her strengths because the Democratic Party, including you know the, the Obama administration and everybody else, had sort of collectively decided that she was a liability and, and nobody was would speak up to defend her if she didn't do it. And that meant that the it created this vicious cycle where because all anybody ever talked about with her was the negative public image, she became associated with that image and that made more people distance themselves from her, which made her seem more toxic in the sort of self-perpetuating loop. Uh, so, and I think, I, I suspect that like a lot of women in politics, she also realized at some point that the sort of shame that is cast on, on people for being arrogant or boastful uh, it seems to apply more to women and men aren't shamed in quite the same way for talking about how great they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think at, certain, at a certain point, a lot of women in politics just decide, you know, I don't care. I'm going to tell you how great I think I am. And if you don't like it, that's too bad. Right. So we have uh, several questions here. Yeah. And I would encourage folks, uh, if you have uh, questions, to please um, type them into the box under ask a question and we will get to as many as we can here. So this one is from Susan. Uh, she says, can you talk about what happened between uh, her and the squad? Do they all get along now? And how did that resolve itself? Yeah, there's a lot of about that if you want a chapter and verse on the battle with the squad last year. But, but in short, I wouldn't say they're best friends, uh, and she has clearly been somewhat dismissive of them. But I think it tells you a lot that you know the squad is sort of this this almost a media creation. A, a, the Republicans love to talk about them as if they're a unit, but they're not a caucus. They're not you know an actual group in the Democratic Party that works together consistently to advance its agenda. Uh, they're they're four people out of a caucus of you know two hundred and thirty forty odd. Uh, and so they're a relatively small faction. And when you're Nancy Pelosi and you care most of all about votes, counting votes, uh, that, that I think is what she focuses on. So when she made that very dismissive comment that caused a lot of acrimony uh, last year saying, well, there are four people and that's how many votes they got, she was speaking very literally she, because she believes that if you believe in you know, a particular position, it's your job to go round up support for that, whether it's public support out in out in public opinion in the general population or votes for legislation inside the building so the fact that this bill that she had negotiated on border funding only had four democratic votes against it to her said this isn't a widespread sentiment this isn't even among the house democrats uh the number of people who view this bill as insufficiently progressive based on what they thought we could get it's a pretty small number. So she did have, you know, a, a, a fence mending meeting with AOC. I think she sees her as as promising, and she has said she she always wants to see more young progressive women in the caucus. Uh, but she also wants to make it clear that AOC is not the reason that Democrats have the majority in the House. Democrats have the House majority because of moderate Democrats who won swing districts, not because you know a, a progressive socialist won a democratic primary for a safe seat that the which is a vote the democrats would have had no matter what so i think uh, i think she views it as as, as an education process uh, for all young members who who come in and have to learn the ropes great Thank you. Um, thanks for that question, Susan. Um, here's a question from Lucy Getman, who is one of our WPI professors. And she says, there are a record number of women for running uh, for Congress in this election cycle, 490, according to our friends at the Center for American Women in Politics. What role does Speaker Pelosi play in cultivating the aspirations of girls and women to run for office? 
Yeah, she has done a lot. And I think she deserves a lot of credit for the fact that there are now a record number of women in the House, more than 100 for the first time in history, aptly timed to the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and she has done a lot to recruit and encourage women candidates. Uh, but for a lot of years, she and I talked about this when I first interviewed her more than two years ago. Uh, she said for a lot of years it was very difficult for her to convince women to run for office, in part because they saw the treatment that she got. They saw the sexist attacks, they saw the incredible volume of attack ads, which many people thought was sort of disproportionate. Uh, and, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi never complained that it was unfair. Politics ain't beanbag, and one of her mottos is throw a punch, take a punch. Uh, but a lot of women aren't that tough and or don't want to be put in that situation facing that onslaught constantly. Uh, so she would always tell people, you know, it's not for the faint of heart, but but she has always tried to encourage more women to run for office. And what we've seen, um, you know, you and a lot of other people who've studied this phenomenon have talked for years and years about the so-called pipeline problem, right? About women not not seeking elected office at the lower levels. So when there's an opening at the higher levels, whether you're talking about Congress or the Senate or governor or whatever, uh, there aren't women who have built up those qualifications. And what we saw in uh, uh, in November 2016, after the presidential election, was that problem disappeared overnight. It was just gone. All of a sudden, tens of thousands of women were saying, where do I sign up? How can I run? I will run for dog catcher. I will run for school board. I will run for county commission, whatever it takes. I just have to do something. Because if that guy can be president, I can certainly do it. Uh, so, it, so, it, so Donald Trump uh, solved the problem that, you know, with all due respect to the uh, Women Politics Institute, uh, thousands of conference seminars and, and well-meaning uh, nonprofits could not. Uh, and, and I think it's safe to say that that, that problem has, has disappeared, at least for the moment. Okay, Maeve has a question. She says, I've heard Pelosi talk more about her husband and kids than most politicians do. How do you think her family life reflects in her work now. Yeah, well, so her kids were more or less grown by the time she ran for office. Uh, she was a, you know, she she was a pretty active volunteer, not, not just a housewife, not that there's anything wrong with that, but she was a homemaker for many, many years. And then when uh, she decided, she promised her friend she would seek that, uh, that seat in Congress, her youngest child was just starting her senior year of high school. And she went to her youngest daughter and said, mommy has an opportunity to run for Congress, but if you don't want me to do it, uh, I won't do it. And her daughter, Alexander said, mom, get a life. <laughs> so <laughs> she so she had that permission from her family to do it. You know, her husband, Paul, has always been very supportive of her political career. I think he consciously keeps himself on the margins in part because you know, the, the family is very wealthy. That's because of him. He's a very successful business as a as a venture capitalist and developer in San Francisco. Um, and uh, and so that's sort of his domain and politics is hers. And he wants her. He, he supports her having her own thing. Um, and, but I think it's also a conscious decision, perhaps on both of their parts, because one thing that you notice with, with powerful women is there's always this hunt to find the man behind her, to find the man who taught her everything she knows, whether it's, you know, Nancy Pelosi's father, she must have learned everything at his knee by the time that she, you know, turned 17 and went off to college. Uh, she, this, she couldn't possibly be responsible for all of this herself, right? Uh, and so I think that Paul has consciously stayed away he you know he goes with her to functions he's very active um in 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 philanthropy and so on um but he doesn't but he isn't a part of her political career at all and and uh with her family with her children all being grown yes she talks a lot about her family as as part of her political motivation and as part of her values uh but and and her daughter christine uh is the one who is really active in politics and has been active in in her political organization um but that's about it great thanks mave um and i would encourage any of you who have other questions to please go ahead and send them in um here's one from lydia and sophia um how do you feel about the new wave of democratic socialists and socialists running for office against moderate dems so i guess you know talk about that difference within the party um well i don't have an opinion about it i'm an observer here not a 
I don't, I don't have a side, but I think it's really interesting. You know, we have seen uh, this trend toward uh, toward the left in the Democratic Party, but I think it's often overstated as well, right? The I I covered the Republican Civil War for many years, and about eighty percent of Republicans consider themselves conservative. We're at a high water mark for a, a generation of of liberals in the Democratic Party, and it's still barely fifty percent. The Democratic Party is still mostly people who consider themselves moderates. And indeed, we did just see the Democratic rank and file nominate a moderate as their presidential nominee. Uh, so uh, so that's part of the reason that we haven't seen a very successful sort of Tea Party of the left. For, for several years, there have been progressive organizations trying to run sort of Tea Party style primaries against entrenched moderate Democrats. And they mostly have not won. AOC is really a, a, an exception in that regard. Most of those candidates have not succeeded in part just because of that numerical disadvantage because they are not necessarily where the base of the party is depending on the district. So, uh, you know, part of what the Tea Party also did in the Republican Party was push everyone further to the right, whether or not they were winning those races. And I think that we've seen that as well in the Democratic Party, that there's a there's a move toward the left. And that also might re reflect broader public sentiment in terms of where, uh, and it's certainly generational as well. The younger generation is much more liberal than their parents, particularly on social issues. So I think we'll see that continue to evolve and it'll be interesting to see uh, if the left has more political success as opposed to sort of uh, movement success. Great, uh, let's see, here's a question. Um from Meg Sommerfeld, she says, what is the most surprising or interesting thing you discovered as you were working on the book? Uh, so many things, um, and I should have a better answer to this question. I think uh, one of the things that I found really interesting, one of the episodes I found really interesting was Nancy Pelosi's passion for human rights in China and for global human rights in general. This isn't something that many people know about her at this point, but it was one of the issues that really brought her to prominence in the 90s. And it pitted her against uh, her own, many people in her own party. Uh, she had some very high profile clashes with Bill Clinton and his administration over the China issue and, and the issue of human rights versus trade in China. Uh, and, uh, and, there, and there's an amazing, uh, look up the video if you can, there's an amazing episode where she actually went to Tiananmen Square in 1991 uh, with a couple of other members, they'd snuck out of their hotels in Beijing and uh, unfurled an activist banner saying for those who died uh, for democracy in China, and they were chased out by Chinese police, uh, almost roughed up. Another fun fact, one of the congressmen who was with her had previously played cooter on the Dukes of Hazard. Uh, <laughs> so um, it's just an amazing video because, uh, you know, she's, she she ended up on the, on the CBS Evening News um, when uh, in that conflict in Tiananmen Square. And then I, I, but then I think almost more amazing than that is they were scheduled to have dinner that night with the Chinese foreign minister. They just caused an international incident. They're being criticized, you know, in the, by the, by Chinese state media. And she insisted that they still go to that dinner. It must've been the world's most uncomfortable dinner, but if there's any larger thing that sort of surprised me about Nancy Pelosi. I think a lot of people perceive her as this sort of cautious or calculating politician, but she's really very bold. And she was willing to stand up to the Chinese authorities, get in their faces, and then eat, and then sit down to dinner with them and sort of dare them to, to bat an eye. And uh, and so she's always had that willingness to, to get in people's faces uh, and to be aggressive and to take risks. I'm kicking myself because I pulled up that picture and I meant to include it in our discussion, but I'm glad you alluded to it. Yeah, hit the Google on it, anybody, because it's a it's a good it's a great photo. Um, here's a question. Uh, let's see from um, Rebecca. She says, "What uh, what are Pelosi's greatest strengths and her weaknesses?" Well, I think her strengths are a lot of the things I've talked about: her tenacity, uh, her aggressiveness, her toughness. Uh, in terms of legislative, you know, she's a very good negotiator. She's very good at, uh, she has an incredible memory for people. I mean, I can't keep any of the members of the House of Representatives straight. And she knows, not only knows every member, but knows what the, their district is, what issues they're passionate about, what caucuses they're a member of, you know, 
whether their their mother is in the hospital or they're going through a divorce or you know the, the, you, you walk into any congressional office and tell if it's a Pelosi ally because there's an orchid in the corner because she always sends orchids whether it's mm. for condolence or congratulations or whatever uh, so she's very good at sort of tending her flock in that way and that's part of the reason that she is so good at holding together a caucus that is incredibly diverse both in ideology and demography and, and geography um, her weakness, so and and you know, if you ask her what where she thinks she's made a mistake or what she regrets from her past, she will say, "I don't do that." She does not indulge regret. It is just not an emotion that she that she does. Uh, she also doesn't do fear, uh, and that tells you a lot about her as well. I think. Um, so I think a lot of people would say that you know that that detail oriented nature sometimes becomes micromanagement or becomes an overly top down controlling type of leadership that that her tenacity does sometimes shade into stubbornness and unwillingness uh, to to let go of things that she's fixated on and you know she rep it's funny that in the late 90s she was accusing the the democratic power structure of not knowing how to run a modern campaign that's a critique that a lot of people level against her now saying well she's still stuck on this sort of new deal era mindset of of what the democrats stand for and should run on and and things are a lot different now um but you know she has come of age in a congress where it was really a lot of scholars argue reshaped by the newt gingrich takeover that's where a lot of people date the, the the onset of a Congress that has become, you know, increasingly gridlocked and partisan and polarized. And she's been able to navigate that. She's been able to get big legislation through, whether it's, you know, bipartisan compromises on things like the coronavirus legislation that we're seeing now, uh, or partisan legislation like the Affordable Care Act that she was is so important to passing in 2010. Uh, she has been able to navigate that and it, in, in a way that a lot of, that I think no other speaker has. The, the Republican speakers who came in between her two speakerships, basically the House fell apart on their watch because they could not control their own members. And that is something that is definitely one of her strengths. Great. Um, let's see. Gloria um, is asking, um, does Pelosi have presidential aspirations? What kind of legislative strategies has she used to become the Speaker of the House, and did she run for local offices? Well, so some of that I have already answered. Her first run was for Congress, um, and, and and I've talked a little bit about her her legislative tactics. Um, she was start from the beginning of her career. You know, she was sort of an up and comer, and sometimes people would say, "Well, maybe she should be on the vice presidential shortlist." She always shot that down pretty promptly. Uh, and has always expressed no interest in any other opening, governor of California, Senate, anything like that. Um, and I think because she has so definitively ruled out using the House as a stepping stone to anything else, that has made her more effective. You know, every politician says, I'm focused on doing this job and I don't have any higher aspirations. Most of them are lying because they do want to be more powerful and have a bigger position. Um, but she is not, and I think people have realized that about her because she doesn't have her eye on the next thing, her caucus knows that she really is focused on doing this job and on making the House Democrats successful, not in order to pad her own resume, as her predecessor was doing, right? Everybody knew that Dick Gephardt wanted to uh, run for president and, uh, and that's fine, but it meant that he had another motivation besides just making the House Democrats as successful as possible. He was positioning himself and she, and she has never been, uh, and, and, and she isn't now, I think, you know, the fact that she's 80 years old would make that a difficult sell. Uh, she's even older than, than Joe Biden, who I think is the oldest uh, major party presidential nominee in history. Uh, I, I, I think it is fun to uh, realize that Nancy Pelosi is a year and a half older than Bernie Sanders. Uh, just, just something to think about. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, Here's a question from Susie. Uh, what do you think is the most important thing that a person with a few hours a week can do um, between now and November 3rd? And I guess I would broaden that out and maybe ask you in general about women's political participation and how you as a political reporter have seen women becoming mobilized and more engaged in the political process. 
Yeah, so I'm not going to give anybody advice because I don't have a side in this thing. But I do, I do think it's cool to see so many people becoming involved and becoming passionate. Right? There's there was a level of of apathy in the American electorate that 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 I think did vanish after 2016, and people have become a lot more engaged. It's been fascinating to watch. I'm really, you know, I started as a local reporter. I started covering politics for the local newspaper in Las Vegas uh, 14 years ago now. And so I've always been interested in politics at sort of that ground level. Uh, Nancy Pelosi's brother, who was the mayor of Baltimore, I uh, used to call it, call it, called that sort of ground level politics. I love this phrase. He called it human nature in the raw. So I'm really interested in how, you know, individuals try to use the political system to advance policies and causes that they're passionate about. Uh, and I'm glad that more and more people see that as a possibility because I think there's a tendency to be cynical, to think like, oh, why bother? There's nothing we can do. It's all sort of frozen in place and there's nothing that an individual human being can do about any of this. Well, there is, and, it's, and, and whether it's the Tea Party of the past 10 years, which was also a fascinating movement that I covered, or whether it's the movement that has arisen now, uh, it's neat to see individuals decide and then get together to do something about their political I think you froze a little bit there, but that was a, a, a good way. Yeah. Can, Sorry, you, can you hear me now? Yeah. But that's that's a good way uh, to end it on, Molly, um, and just the importance of, of people becoming involved one way or another uh, in politics um, and engaging in the process. Um, so I want to thank you for, for so much for, for doing this and uh, appreciate all of your insights. And it's a terrific book. I encourage everybody, if you haven't had a chance uh, to read it, to uh, do that. It makes for good uh, reading at home in our um, PJs and uh, sweatpants <laughs> during all of this. Um, I want to let everybody know that we um, this is the first in our series for the summer. We are going to do um, a book event next week with uh, Valerie Jarrett on her new book. And you can sign up for that. Uh, right on this same CrowdQuest page, we should have the registration information available for that. And if you missed any of our discussion with Molly, a few minutes after the broadcast, again, on that same registration link, you can hit a replay uh, and watch any part of um, today's discussion with Molly. So thank you, everybody, for being here. And thanks once again, Molly. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Betsy. Bye. For a great event.